Back in January, NVIDIA promised us a revolution. A personal AI supercomputer on your desk. Like this, a physical thing that you can just plop down and use. It's now fall of 2025. And guess what? The so-called DGX Spark is still nowhere to be found. Just to catch you up real quick, the DGX Spark is supposed to be the world's smallest AI supercomputer. During CES, it was originally called Project Digits. You might've seen that. And during GTC in March, it officially launched, but uh, it kind of didn't. We were all really excited to go up and register and pre-order it, but there was just a waiting list, a reservation. So this is a brand new architecture, Grace Blackwell GB10 chip. It was supposed to be given to developers and researchers and have one petaflop of AI compute. Well, Nvidia is coming to GTC in Washington DC, where I am right now in October. Maybe I'll run to Jensen over there and I'll ask him. <laughs> uh, wishful thinking, right? Or maybe it'll be out by then. The question is, is it still worth it? It's got 128 gigabytes of RAM on board, which means you can fit really large models in there and a bunch of other features that I'll talk about in a minute, which are different than the machines we have right now. We have already something like this. This is the GMK Tech Evo X2. I did a review on this one and it's got the Ryzen AI Max Plus 395. Framework also has their version of the 395 chip in the Framework desktop. Yeah, the desktop is also available. There's also the M3 Ultra Max Studio, which packs a whopping 819 gigabits per second memory bandwidth. And on paper, it kind of sounds like a no brainer. That memory bandwidth on the Mac Studio is way higher than the DJX Spark is supposed to have at 273 gigabytes per second. So why would you even consider that still, considering it's a $4,000 machine, $1,000 more than Jensen originally said? Hang out with me for a minute. So yesterday I let an LLM scaffold a service. It nailed the async pipeline and then it shipped an endpoint with an N plus one query and no indexes. Classic, right? That's why even after decades of building software, I still invest in my own skills. Tech moves fast and you can't count on AI for the fundamentals. Meet Boot.dev, today's sponsor and honestly the most engaging way I found to learn backend web development. It's like an RPG for coding, quests, XP, leaderboards, and an integrated AI guide called Boot so you can actually stick with it and finish. You get practical projects and courses in Python, Go, JavaScript that map to real backend work. APIs, auth, databases, testing, caching, the good stuff. There's a helpful Discord, clear solutions when you're stuck, and a curriculum focused on job-ready skills instead of endless theory. The best part? You can browse all the lessons for free. A membership unlocks interactive coding, AI help, progress tracking, and the game mechanics. I used to binge back and tutorials like a Netflix show. Great entertainment, but zero muscle. Boot.dev turns that time into reps that actually build production-ready services. Ready to level up? Head to boot.dev in the link below and use my code for 25% off your first payment. See you in the quests. The DGX Spark is not just a regular computer. You can't just plop Windows on it or Mac OS. It's got a special chip on it, which is different than anything we've seen before. And this chip, coupled with the amount of memory this machine is gonna have, you can probably probably fine tune or run a model with up to 200 billion parameters locally. And for that, the $4,000 price tag seemed a little bit more approachable, even though it's still pretty high, but you know, <laughs> the Mac Studio is not cheap. This version is about four grand. Basically all the 128 gigabyte versions of the Max Plus 395 are around $2,000 a piece. And if you don't go with the PNY version of the Spark, which is that pretty gold box right there, then you can get one from other partners like Asus, Dell, Lenovo, MSI. They're all gonna have this GB10 chip in little mini PCs, but they're all on hold, which gives hints about the kind of issues that they're running into. Now, despite the big promises and even taking pre-order reservations, Nvidia missed their May release date and then uh, their summer release date. Will be available shortly probably in a few weeks. And there hasn't been any official explanation from Nvidia, but there has been some speculation suggesting that perhaps there are some production and supply issues. And it points to this GB10 Grace Blackwell chip. We've all heard of Blackwell by this point. That's the GPU side of things, right? This is the 5090, the 50 series all have Blackwell chips inside and they're all out and about already. But the Grace part of it <laughs> is not yet out and about. And that's uh, co-developed with MediaTek. It did come with promising performance 
performance figures and this points to uncertainty in supply chain regarding the product there isn't any official uh, statements so this is just rumors at this point maybe they're facing yield or manufacturing delays bottlenecking the whole product launch whatever the cause may be no items have been shipped yet so spark is kind of starting to feel like vaporware but they keep saying it's coming so is it still worth the wait what do you think let me know in the comments down below are you waiting for yours despite the delays and mounting competition the djx spark still has a few tricks up its sleeve that keep it on our radar at least on mine here are some key reasons why this little gold box is pretty intriguing prospect for AI enthusiasts and professionals. The Blackwell GPU introduces fifth generation tensor cores with support for ultra low precision formats like FP8 and FP4. Tensor cores are a part of the NVIDIA GPUs and they're meant to complement the CUDA cores. That's Julia Turk, former Google machine learning researcher. So the CUDA cores are the engines that coordinate most of the communication in the GPU and most of the general purpose operations. And tensor cores very specifically focus focus on matrix multiplications. And that's useful both for graphics, but also in AI, where a lot of the computation that happens behind an AI model is basically matrix multiplications. So Julia, what about FP4 and FP8? Both FP4 and FP8 are numeric formats. FP4 or floating point four uses four bits and FP8 or floating point eight uses eight bits. If you use fewer bits, that means you use less memory and the operations will be faster. If we take very large numbers and we compress them into four bits, in smart ways, we can keep enough precision so that LLMs work well enough, especially if you really want to run things locally. And even more interestingly, people are starting to train models directly in floating point four. This means that Spark can perform AI computations at four bit or eight bit floating point precision natively. One small qualification I want to make there is that they're actually in mixed precision, but most of the matrix multiplications run in floating point four. So what are the gains that you can get by quantizing down to FP4? If we compare FP4 against FP8 and we look at NVIDIA's reported numbers, they report a 5x increase in speed. Nice. That's very unexpected. You would expect a 2x increase in speed, but that's because they complement these uh, formats. They bring in a lot more optimizations, and that includes the way the memory is laid out, even software improvements. So that's why they're able to increase the speed even more than 2x. In a recent video, I showed how this Blackwell chip performs in an RTX Pro 6000. It just blows anything else out of the water. That one has 96 gigabytes of RAM the spark is supposed to have 128. Julia, thanks for breaking that down. Thanks so much. Let's keep in touch. I'll link to Julia's YouTube channel and her FP4 breakdown video. She goes way into the weeds on this stuff. Good watch. So in practical terms, you can squeeze more performance out of models by quantizing them down to FP4 or FP8 without losing too much accuracy. It's kind of like having a secret turbo mode for AI calculations. The next thing is it's built for clustering. While getting a bunch of Macs clustered up, I have videos on both the Mac Mini and the Mac Studios, or trying to cluster up some of these more modern machines like the AMDs is uh, not as easy as it seems at first. And then you're kind of limited by the bandwidth of either Thunderbolt connections or whatever network card you have in there. Even if you upgrade your network connectivity and put something like this in there, this will give you 25 gigabit. There's even cards that are 50. It's still not even close to the Connect 7 Smart NIC in each one of these NVIDIA Spark units. This comes designed for clustering out of the box. You can cluster two DGX Sparks directly with up to 200 gigabits per second, which is just nuts. That's 256 gigabytes of memory together, shared. And NVIDIA actually supports officially two node Spark clusters. And they say that that lets you tackle models of up to 400 billion parameters in size. I wonder what it takes to get this 400G Ethernet network adapter. More than $4,000. And clustering two machines isn't unique in the computing world, but the ease and speed of Spark's built-in approach is. The ability to simply plug two units together and get unified 256 gigabytes of system memory is a big selling point for those who need more than what any single machine at this price point can offer. And at that point, $4,000 well, it's actually going to be $8,000 at that point, isn't it? But even then, you're getting 256 gigabytes 
of memory at that high bandwidth, it's gonna be really fast and really nice. I do have to wonder, 256 gigabytes in a Mac studio at 819 gigabytes per second. Oh, I'm gonna have to test that out. I'm sure somebody's done the math, but uh, you know how math goes and how real world performance goes. They sometimes don't really align, so we'll have to see what it is in practice. One more thing, the CUDA and software ecosystem. We've talked about this before. Hardware aside, let's not forget that NVIDIA software stack. DJX Spark comes with the full NVIDIA AI software suite. We're talking about CUDA, we're talking about TensorRT, etc. Everything is gonna be pre-installed on its own custom DJX OS. Ubuntu based, the breadth of libraries, frameworks, and developer tools that support NVIDIA GPUs out of the box is a huge plus. AMD is still struggling to have RDNA 4 architecture supported with uh, Rockham. They're working on it, but it's a slow process, whereas CUDA has been around for years and it just keeps getting better and better and better. There's other APIs like Vulkan on AMD that work pretty well and across platform. And that's great, but it's still nowhere near where CUDA is for NVIDIA. From PyTorch to TensorFlow to NVIDIA's own optimized frameworks like Nemo for LLMs or Isaac for robotics, everything is tuned to run on CUDA. This just means less time wrestling with compatibility or hack together support and more time actually training or inferencing models. So the DJX Spark, small as it is, benefits from the maturity of the NVIDIA AI ecosystem. And once you're done developing on that little box, you could just send it up to the cloud wherever it's gonna actually work. Maybe it's gonna just keep working on your desk or maybe you're gonna send it up. In theory, it's not gonna require any additional development to get it to scale to larger GPUs. That's that lock-in that they got you in, that ecosystem. But hey, Apple has their own wall garden. NVIDIA has their own wall garden. Once they lock you in, they lock you in because it works. As professionals, as developers, some people like to fight the system. Other people like to use the system to take advantage of what's available and get their job done. Use the best tool for the job. That's what I always say. So the Spark isn't just a GPU. It's a full system on chip pairing a 20 core ARM CPU. That's the grace part with the black old GPU via NVLink C2C. Gives us a coherent memory architecture, meaning the CPU and the GPU share that 120 gigabytes pool efficiently kind of like Apple's unified memory. Now its memory bandwidth is only 273 gigabytes a second. It's not the best. Far below a typical desktop GPU's bandwidth. <laughs> to give you an example, the 5090 has a bandwidth of about 1700. Yeah, 1792 gigabytes per second, a bit more, but only 32 gigs of memory. The sheer size of the memory, 128 gigabytes and coherence should make up for it in many AI tasks. Just think about it. You can keep entire large models entirely in memory without sharding across devices. This is something that Mac Studio owners are pretty familiar with, like I mentioned earlier, but we'll see what we actually get uh, when we're comparing the two systems. It's gonna be interesting, that's all I can say. So here we are almost at the end of 2025. No DJX Spark yet in hand. Are you waiting for yours? Leave a comment down below. We'll see when it finally lands and I'm trying to get one or two in here to test them out. I'll be keeping a close eye on that for any updates. Also, NVIDIA is holding a big AI conference, GTC in Washington, DC, my hometown this October. So I plan to be there. If you see me, stop by and say hi. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you at the NVIDIA conference or maybe around. Have a good one. Bye-bye.